the person next to you and say, welcome to LifeBridge. Welcome to LifeBridge. <laughs> On this incredible sunny morning, temperatures above freezing, it's a beautiful day. Okay, all I said was say, welcome to LifeBridge. I didn't say anything else. <laughs> Well, grab that connection card on your seat, put your name on the front of it, fill out any information you're comfortable filling out, and as you go through the service, just think through, is there any comments you want to give us, any thoughts, any questions, any action steps that you feel God's prompting you to take, and any prayer uh, items that you might have that you would like us as a church praying for. So take note of that and we'll refer back to it later on. We had an excellent night last night. Uh, Melissa Wise and her team organized a benefit uh, concert for uh, raising funds for the typhoon relief efforts and uh, in the Philippines. We had a, a good showing. We raised over $1,500, so good for you. This is an... Um, this is one of those things where Melissa just had never done anything like this before, but just had the sense of calling from God that she's supposed to do it. No experience, no grasp of what to do, but other than since I got to do this. And she did it. She pulled people together. She made it all happen. And uh, good for you. Stepping out in faith is what we want to be encouraging everyone to do. When God gives you a sense of mission, act on it and do something with that. And that's really exciting. And so, uh, also, we just want to remind you that this Friday is actually Good Friday, and next Sunday is actually Easter. Can you believe that? It's coming already. So, we want to be encouraging you, come on Good Friday. We're actually going to walk through the tabernacle and, and the symbols of the tabernacle and just talk about what Christ accomplished on the cross in light of the Old Testament tabernacle as a picture. It, it'll just be a cool time, but it, ultimately, it's about worship and it's about communion and um, saying thanks, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. Easter Sunday is then a celebration that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and we want to be uh, using this as a time to invite people. If people go to church only once or twice a year, Easter is normally one of those times. So why don't you invite them to come to LifeBridge? It'd be cool to fill up this place that we have to haul seats in from other places. So uh, being sure to do that. Think through, who am I going to invite to Easter this coming week? And, uh, and make sure you, you go ahead. If you actually want us to pray for you and the person you're inviting, you can write that on your connection card. And we'll be praying for you and the people that you want to invite. So uh, just take note of that. Speaking of prayer, why don't we do that right now? Why don't we invite God to be here and speak to us this morning? Father, we want to thank you that you care about people, all people. And it doesn't matter whether they're rebelling against you or whether they're walking with you. You still love them. You love each and every one of us. And Lord, I just want to thank you that you stirred Melissa's heart to raise funds for um, your children in the Philippines to just help out people who have been devastated there. And Lord, I just pray that you'd take those funds and you'd multiply them and you'd use them for, uh, for great purposes. Lord, uh, we want to pray for our ministry partners in Honduras today uh, with Manos Extendidas, with Compassion International. Lord, we pray that you'd work through our ministry partners there today to build your kingdom, to encourage people, to strengthen people, to equip people, and so that your church would have impact uh, to change those communities. And so, Father, we pray specifically for them, and we pray for us here today. Lord, I pray that your presence would be here both in the nursery, in Kidsbridge, Lead 5-6, and here in the Connection Service. Would your spirit speak? Would you convict? Would you motivate? Would you encourage? Whatever you need to do in our lives today to make us more like you, would you do that? And uh, might we just uh, mature and walk closer to you today? So thanks for the gift of today. Thanks for this time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a test. I just passed. It's the only, it's the only test I'm going to pass all day. The microphone is working. That's good. Well, I just want to welcome you here this morning. And uh, for some of you... Uh, you may not have seen me before, most of you have. Just by way of reminder, uh, my name is Gordon, uh, and on the slide, I hope you see behind you, uh, you will see myself and my wife Anna, and you will see Heidi and Hobo. Do you see them? Yes. 
That's our family. I know they don't look a lot like us, but they really are our kids. Uh, we treat them just like that. We are actually here. We kinda, we've, we've done the cross-country tour, so we're all the way back to Coal Harbor from Vancouver and Alberta and Abbotsford and Surrey and Malag and Entwistle and I don't know where else. I, every, every once in a while I'd stop and I'd be visiting with people and I'd say, where, where am I again? And they would have to remind me which town or which city or, or even which church I was at. But let me ask you a question. Can you remember the first time that you were in a church? Can you remember the first time that you were in this church? Who took you? Who brought you? Who did you, who did you go to church with when you were there? How did you get there? I actually don't remember the first time I was in church because I would have been in diapers. I know that's, that's probably a bad picture for you, but <laughs> actually it is for me too. Uh, but it's true. So I don't technically remember it. I see that, I see that smirk, by the way. <laughs> like the visual, huh? So for us, but the first time we came to church here at LifeBridge was like seven years ago. And we were on an escape weekend. We wanted to, to escape from the, the rigors of ministry, so we came to Halifax, and we got LifeBridge from, you know, we were the one family, I think, that ever got LifeBridge from the Yellow Pages, and then we went to the website. <laughs> sorry, to remind, sorry to bring that up, Rob. The, the very expensive Yellow Page ad that LifeBridge paid for, I don't know how many thousands of dollars, but hey, we, we, we won't remind Rob of that. But, but we actually, we were just like seven years ago, and then we, over, the, over the course of time, we, we came three different times, and then you invited us to come. And that's been almost five years now. And uh, that's pretty awesome for us to think about that when we reflect. I can't believe how, how fast five years has gone. Like, the older I get, the faster time seems to go. But most of us come to church because we were invited by someone. Someone said, hey, why don't you come with me to church? Or if it's your wife, she said, we're going to church and let's go. <laughs> that's what Anna did to me. But we come to Jesus the same way. We come by invitation. You know, he invites us to come. There's a verse that's typically used that way. It's in Revelation 3.20. And Jesus says to the church, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. But he's not exactly talking to individuals. He's talking to a, to a self-deluded church. He's talking to a church that's kind of off track. And he's saying, come to me. Come back to the relationship with me. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, for no one can come to me. You can't come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. So no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. And the Father is saying, come to me. That's what he's saying. So have you actually received that invitation? Have you ever received that invitation where you know somehow that Jesus is saying, come to me? Have you responded to that invitation? Maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, well, you know what? I've never really responded to that invitation. Well, you're in the right place. He is inviting you into a relationship. And for the disciples, it was the same thing. And when Jesus invited them, he invited them to this thing. It was, it was like... It, if you, picture a, if you picture a table, this huge table with all this stuff on it, and he invited the disciples to a table. Kind of like a banquet table or, or a buffet table, if you will. Ever been to a buffet? <laughs> Anyone ever not been to a buffet? Well, the largest buffet, the, the biggest buffet I've ever been to was in Pennsylvania. And I was looking for a, for a Mennonite restaurant, and I, and I thought, oh, this will be just a nice little cozy little restaurant in, the, in this little house. And so we went, and the, I stopped at the store, and the guy gave us directions. And he says, I said, well, how am I going to know when I find it? I'm just picturing the small little building that I might drive by. He said, oh, he said, you'll know it when you see it. Well, I knew it when I saw it. <laughs> it was huge. It was bigger than any grocery store or department store that I've ever been in. It was massive. And then we went inside and I looked at the, at the buffet line. And you can't actually see the entire buffet line. It is, and so we, it was like, 
wow. It was cost us like under $10 to go in. I can't believe how much food is there. And I'm looking at all this stuff. So I went up one aisle, then back down the other aisle, then back up again. I'm, I'm scoping it out. I'm thinking, well, I can only eat so much. So I'm going to make sure that I get the stuff I really, really want. And then I got halfway up, and I realized that that was only halfway. They actually repeated this huge buffet on the second half of the restaurant. You can't believe it. When you stand at one end, you're looking, and you can barely see the other end of the buffet line. It's massive. And for the disciples, like, like for you and me, Jesus invites us to a table. And this table has amazing stuff on it, like the, some of the best stuff you've ever seen. And they had some of the best food I've ever eaten, by the way, if you ever go to Pennsylvania. But the table that Jesus invites us to, is, is a, it's a symbol and it's a symbol of love. It's a symbol of, of intimacy, of closeness. It's like, it's like a symbol of, of, what, of what it means to, to know and be known by God. And for, so for the disciples and for you and me, it's kind of like the difference. It's like the difference between law, rules, and the gospel. It's a difference between religion and relationship. It's the difference between duty and love. See, we, we get into problems. I get into problems when I, when I forget some things about God. And I think you do too. We all do. We get, when we get confused about what God has for us and what God expects from us, we get into trouble. We get sidetracked. Sometimes we just get sidetracked by sin, the wrong stuff. We start doing the things that God says don't do. And we stop doing the things that God says, I want you to do this. That's sin. So we get sidetracked by sin. It happens to every believer at times. But sometimes we, we get sidetracked by things that are not necessarily bad. You know, they're, they're good. They're They're okay. But they're lesser things. They're things that are not quite as important. And we kind of get sidetracked. We say, oh, I'm, I'm off on this. And yet it's, it's not God's best for us. It's, it's a lesser thing. We lose our focus. Ever do that? Ever get sidetracked? We forget what we're all about. We forget for those of you who have responded to Jesus' invitation, we forget what drew us to Jesus in the first place. We forget. Or maybe you're in the place right now where you're saying, you know what, I, I'm, somehow I'm attracted to Jesus. I just don't understand. Like, I don't know what's going on, but, but I, I feel this draw to Jesus, and I can't explain it. If and when I'm in the place where I'm trying to figure that all out, where I'm trying to find my way, where I'm trying to figure out who Jesus is and what he's all about, that's not a bad place to be. Or if I, but if I'm confused, or if I get sidetracked, or if I lose my focus, or if I'm looking to gain focus to see who Jesus really is, that's a problem. It's a problem for me. It's a problem for you. And so the question is, what can I do? What can I do to gain a correct focus? Or what can I do to regain the focus I once had? And that's the question we're going to be looking at this morning. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know what it's like around your house, but around my house, this is a, this is, th these are not normally in a box, but I, I often wish they were, because I find myself at times frequently looking for the things that are contained in this particular box. And I was reminded of that yesterday, I guess Friday, when we went to the optometrist. And, uh, and he told me that I need new glasses, and, and I thought, man, I already have glasses. I've got all kinds of glasses. I've got... I've got these glasses, and, 
And I've got, I've got these. These are, these are particular beauties. I've got these, and, and, I have, and I have these. They come in a case, and, and I have all kinds of glasses, and there are times when I wish that they had, they had the strength of these because typically they make prints so small that sometimes I feel like I need binoculars to actually see. And then, and then my friend Dave, uh, who, uh, you know Dave, uh, the, the guy who doesn't want to admit that he needs glasses, went out and bought some, some really neat glasses, and, and they're, they're kind of indestructible almost, especially when they're in the case. You know, they're telescopic. Aren't they cool? You know, and, and the only problem with these ones is the case is so small that sometimes I can't find the case. But, but, but believe me when I say that, that these are absolutely necessary for me. And I found that when I was at the optometrist, and he, you know how they, they flick the thing and it gets clearer, and then I'd say, no, go back. And, and you know, you, you're trying to get the perfect focus. You're trying to get the absolute best focus you can because when you go and spend that kind of money on glasses, you want to make sure you have, a, you have the right ones. Well, that's where I was, and it, it made me think about what, what I was going to be talking about today because I thought, you know, for us... We, we spend time trying to get focused on the right things or refocused when, we, when things get blurry in life and in our spiritual lives too. But there's biblical examples, lots of them. And probably one of the best biblical examples of somebody who had a real focused problem is the Apostle Peter. I mean, Peter is, Peter's an amazing guy. You know, he's the guy that when Jesus saw him, he said, you know, there, there he is. You know, Jesus saw him, Jesus knew him. And he looked at him, he said, you are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas. Right away, he makes this big impression. I mean, everything that Peter did was kind of big, if you know what I mean. He stood out. You know, Peter, Peter had big steps of faith, and Peter had big mistakes, big missteps, if you will. Kind of like us. And Jesus comes along to him a little bit later, and he says to Peter, I know what's going on in your life, and there was this huge, there was this huge thing that happened, and Jesus is teaching, and, and, and Peter's touched by what happens, because it's not just what Jesus says, it's what he does. And they went fishing all night, and they didn't catch any fish, and Jesus said, oh, after he's done teaching, he said, oh, go on out and put, the, put your boat on the water, we're going to go fishing, he said, Oh, no, he said, we're not going to fish. There's no fish out there. We were out there all night. We didn't catch anything. Jesus said, let's go. So they went. And they caught so many fish that it filled two boats. And Peter realized, Peter realized something about who he was with. And he knew that he was in a bad spot. And he said, go away from me because I'm a sinful man. Peter knew where he was in relation to Jesus. And Jesus said this in Luke chapter 5, verse 11. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of me, Jesus said. Don't be afraid of who I am. Don't be afraid of what I'll do in your life. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. You're not going to fish for fish. You're not going to fish for money. You're not going to fish for, for prominence. You're not going to fish for all this stuff. You're going to fish for people. Lost people. And so, so Peter started to follow him. Now, I don't know about you, but if you imagine Peter's life, you imagine the drama of Jesus coming up to him and saying, now I want you to drop everything and I want you to follow me. Make me the center of your life. It took full commitment. Everything he had. How about you? I know in my life it was the same thing. I ran from that full commitment when I was a teenager. You can't run from God, by the way. The Bible's very clear. If you go in the mountains, He's there. If you go to the depths of the ocean, He's there. If you go to the ends of the earth, He is there. You can't hide from God. That may be good news to you. That may be bad news. I tried it. But at 35, He caught up to me. And I knew what it meant. It was a full commitment. So I said, okay, God. After a little wrestling match, I said, you're in charge. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Do you remember what that was like for you if you've, if you've been in that position where you gave your heart to Jesus? Do you remember what it was like in the very beginning? How exciting it was? It was all new. It's all fresh. Do you remember that? 
all the love that was there, all the, all the open-armed acceptance, all the forgiveness for all the garbage in your past. Do you remember what it was like? I do. I don't like to remember the garbage, but I remember it. It was awesome. It's like, it's like this, my whole life has changed because of him. Praise God. Do you remember that? Sometimes we lose sight of that. We, we lose focus. We get off track. We get sidetracked on all these other things. Peter, uh, Peter is a guy like you and I. Peter had highs and Peter, Peter had lows. You know, one minute Peter's, Peter sees Jesus walking on the water and he goes, wow. And Jesus said, it's all right. It's me. Don't worry. And he said, oh my goodness. He said, well, if it's you, Lord, it's, a, it's at night. He said, if it's you, tell me to come to you. So he did. Peter steps out of the boat. He starts walking on water. That's new. Unless you've done it. And then when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out. He said, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he said, you of what? Little faith. Why did you doubt? You started out so good. You took those first few steps, and it was so good. And then all of a sudden, you started to doubt. You started to doubt who I was and what I could do. And you started to sink. High and low. <laughs> One breath, next breath. Peter, high, low. <laughs> when he confessed Jesus as the Christ in Matthew chapter 16, Everybody was talking about who Jesus was, and they were trying to figure out, well, who is he? Is he this person? Is he that person? Did he come back from the grave? Who is he? And Jesus asked his disciples, he said, who do you say that I am in Matthew chapter 16? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by your flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You didn't figure this out on your own. God revealed it to you. It doesn't get any higher than that. Next breath. Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders. This is kind of the time of year that we're in right now when this is happening. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. That can't be right. No way. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Peter? No. Get behind me, Satan. Why did he say that? He said it because Peter had in mind the things of the enemy, not the things of God. And he thought it was all going to be good. It was all going to be rosy. He's not going to be problems. But he was wrong. He said, get behind me, Satan. Isn't that kind of like us sometimes? Following Jesus can't mean this. Like, Jesus can't expect me to do that. You've got to be, I mean, if he, were, if he really cared for me, he would never expect me to do this. You ever think those things? I don't like it. <laughs> ever think that? That's us. And then Peter's lowest low. If you've ever been at, a, at the lowest point in your life, Peter hit it. And he hit it after saying, I will never give up on you. I will follow you right to the death. And then he began to call down curses. Matthew, Mark chapter 14, he began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I don't know this man you were talking about. The same one who swore he would go to the death for this man, he would, go to, he would die for him, said, I don't even know him. And he cursed. Wow. <laughs> And he broke down and he wept when he realized what had happened. It doesn't get any lower than that. Right from that, right into the highest high, shortly after, after the resurrection, Jesus met with Simon Peter and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this stuff? Do you love me more than these people? Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than you? Do you love me more than these Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And, and Peter was hurt. Peter was hurt because he knew that Jesus knew that he loved him. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Then he said to him this, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. That's the Christian life, following Jesus. It's not about religion. It's not about necessarily going to church. It's not about doing some of the things that we think we have to do or we should do or we need to do or we ought to do. It's following Jesus. That's it. It's about following Jesus. But we get sidetracked. I get sidetracked sometimes. I lose my focus. I get confused. So what, what can I do? What can you do when we lose our focus, when things get fuzzy, when, when following Jesus, the Christian life kind of gets blurry, we kind of go, I don't even know what this is all about. I thought I knew, but I don't know. I used to think it was about this, and now I'm not even sure. What is it all about? That's a loss of focus. We can do what Peter did. We can do exactly what Peter did by following Jesus. By focusing on Him. And when I follow Jesus and I focus on Him, I end up on mission. <laughs> it doesn't matter where I am. You can be in Coal Harbor or the HRM or New Brunswick or Alberta. or B You can be in Honduras. It doesn't matter where you are. When you're following Jesus, you're on mission. Wherever you are. And that's what he wants us to do, to regain our focus. Your life is about him. Uh, my life is about him first, where he's at the center. And the Son of Man, in Luke 19, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came for the sheep. He came for the lambs that he told Peter to feed. He came for, for you. He came for me. He came for your neighbor. He came for somebody in your family, your friends, people you work with. That's who he came for, the lost. For Anna and I, that, that journey of following Jesus is leading us to Honduras. I didn't ask for that. I actually asked for the opposite. <laughs> not, not, nothing against Honduras, you understand, but I didn't ask for that. It's not, not our idea. And Jesus is moving us to Tegucigalpa, Honduras. I don't know what it'll be like to live there. I've spent a week sort of living there. <laughs> I think it'll be a lot different when we move than what it was in the week that we were there. But he's calling us to do there what he wants us to do and has called us to do here, to be his hands to be his feet, be his voice. That's the mission wherever you are. Where you live today, where you socialize, where you play, where he sends you. In Honduras, he's going to send us to, to poor, <laughs> they're almost all poor communities. I mean, they're, yeah, yeah, 95% of them are poor communities. You know, when you see houses there, when you, when you see what, what, what they call roads, whether it were pass for roads, <laughs> you know, you kind of go, wow, this is just a whole different place than what I'm used to. He's sending us to, to, to work in the feeding centers where, where kids come to learn. Yeah, they learn about hygiene. They learn about school stuff. They come primarily to learn about Jesus. And they realize these kids come with needs, so they help meet those needs as part of that. But we'll be going to the feeding centers. And as Anna said, the orphanages. Do you know how many times I heard the phrase tiny houses before I ever saw it? I don't know how many times I heard LifeBridge people talking about tiny houses this, tiny houses that, tiny houses. I'm thinking, what is this place, this tiny houses? But when you go there, you, you, 
you never leave unchanged. Those tiny houses are filled with tiny people. And those tiny people, Jesus loves them. He died for them. But everybody else has abandoned them. Everybody else has forgotten them. Everybody else is too wrapped up in their own business. Jesus is. Invente Uno. Talk to the people who are in Vente Uno. And ask them about their God experience in Vente Uno when, when, when Nati shared his faith. Just, just ask. You can ask Cliff or Sherry. You can ask Dave and Shelley if they ever come home from their journeys. You know, you can ask Anna and I. I can't remember who else was there and now it's escaping me. Ask us about our God experience in Vente Uno, the home for adolescent boys. Or on the streets getting ready to go in the streets. When you see a kitchen full of, I don't know how many people, making sandwiches and having a good time and laughing, and, 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 and then when you get out in the streets, you realize that, that it's, it, it's like a world you have never seen when you go to the streets in Honduras at night. You, you can't even imagine. And all the pictures that you've seen, until you experience, like you just, you're getting a glimpse of it, but you can't imagine it until you get there. Or the dump, where people are picking up their supper, children as young as three or four years old, picking up their, their supper out of the garbage. You, you, don't, you don't see that and remain unchanged. Or Gracie, who Anna gave her shoes to. <laughs> She's a beautiful girl. And so was her sister and so was her mother. And in the churches, you know, when you go and you worship in a church where people are a little more engaged than typically we are here in in Coal Harbor Valley. <laughs> not always. We're getting, we're getting there. But it's certainly nothing compared to worshiping in, in, in the Spanish culture. There's so, there's so much energy in the room and it's so much fun. And, and worshiping in, in the churches. And when you look at the leaders, I look around here this morning and we're, we're, we're a, we're a multi-age group. You know, we're where I, I'm kind of in, you know, I don't bring the median age up a whole lot, but when I go to church there, I bring the median age up quite a bit in the, in the, in the worship settings in Honduras. And leaders like Alvin and his wife Nellie and their daughters, and leaders like Natty and Marta, and Natty who's been through horrendous stuff but has planted a church while he's working two little businesses, trying to make his family work, this is what he's doing. This is crazy. I think it's awesome. <laughs> but that's what he's doing. And Bessie and Carlos and Marcos, they're all young. Not kids, but they're young. But God is calling us to go there to help, to help them, is to come alongside and do whatever it takes. That's mission, but that's mission at LifeBridge. Just coming alongside to do whatever, just to help make it happen. That's your part, whether you're here, whether you're there. In Matthew chapter 25, there's a whole passage there that I encourage you to read later. It starts around verse 31. Jesus is talking about what it's gonna be like in the end times when, when I come from my people. And he said, I'm going to separate the real ones from the fakes. There will be a separating of the sheep and the goats, if you will. And he's going to say to them, listen, you know, when you fed me, when you clothed me, when you gave me a cup of cold water, and people are going to go, when did I ever do that? You were gone long before I was born. When did I ever do that? And Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, and the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, when you did it to the person who was overlooked, when you did it to the person who was forgotten, when you did it to the person who was ignored, you were doing it to me. You were giving me a cup of cold water. You were feeding me. You were visiting me in the hospital. You were visiting me in prison. It was me you were doing it to, not them. It was me. You want to regain your focus? 
Not a bad thing, really, when you think about it. Go to a place like Potter's Field. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a graveyard. Go to a place like Potter's Field. And think about the people who end up in a place like Potter's Field. Either in a mass grave, or in an unmarked grave, or in a marked grave. Because that's all they can afford. Virtually nothing. For me, regaining focus is about Jesus' heart and mission. Where I am. Going on a short-term mission with LifeBridge. I needed the mission. I needed to go. It helped me refocus. It's Jesus' heart and mission where I am. For you, it's Jesus' heart and mission where you are. Short-term mission to Honduras. Where, where, wherever you are doing what Jesus wants you to do, following him, that's mission. And when I'm doing that, I am focused the way he wants me to be focused. Imagine living a life where you're just forgotten. You're ignored. You're shoved aside. When life seems like there's no hope for today, for tomorrow, forever. There are people in your world today who feel like that, who are lost. There are people in Honduras who are lost. And that's why he's calling us there, while we're there. But that's what he's called us to do here. You have a mission. We all do. The question is whether or not I will take up that mission and do it wherever I am. And that's the challenge. Going on a mission trip can sometimes bring to the surface God's plan for mission and your involvement in mission. Uh, Gordon and Anna were impacted by their mission trip to Honduras in 2013. Uh, I don't know if um, all of you are aware, but Dave and Shelley Tonin are in Honduras right now. They are, in, uh, they are taking a three-week language course and learning Spanish. So that uh, then on the fourth week, when they go into Tegucigalpa and they meet their sponsor child, hopefully they'll be able to communicate a little bit in the language uh, to their sponsor child as a, instead of just saying hola. <laughs> So you know what, we encourage you to start planning for the mission trip uh, in the summer of 2015. Not this summer, but the next summer, we're sending another team down to Honduras. Hopefully Gordon and Anna will be well established there and then they'll be the ones showing you around. And so uh, we, we uh, encourage you to start thinking that way.